What if I were to tell you that one single business could take over an entire nation, poisoning a country's water supply with cancer-causing substances, destroying the nature and livelihood of millions? A business in control of a major nation's own national military, with full control of their government, using propaganda and killing protesters who get in their way? Well, this is what's been happening with Shell in Nigeria. Shell. A business who's owned by some of the biggest royal families in the world has now quite literally colonized an entire country. They have developed a blueprint for companies around the world to take over nations. This is a story that has been covered up internationally. Propaganda runs deep because if people knew the true extent of the story, there would be global outrage. And it's time we talked about it. So how could one single company take over an entire nation? Well, there's several steps you have to take. The initial and most obvious step when taking over a foreign nation is first deciding which one will be the target. The location needs to have untapped resources, whether it be people, minerals, or oil. If you can get all three, that's perfect. And it's even better if these are the things that the majority of the country's revenue comes from, whether it be solely bananas, diamonds, copper, or the most prolific of all, oil. Second, the company needs to be able to control the government. And although this can be done with force, it's much easier and more effective to secure influence over a country using money. That way no one notices and everyone wins. So which country fulfills this criteria? Where could Shell find a nation with untapped oil reserves and an easily bribable government and military? Well, it just so happened that there was a perfect country crossing off all these boxes on the checklist, Nigeria. So now it was time for step two, making Nigerian officials completely dependent on Shell. So how do you get Nigerian officials dependent on a single business? Well, you have to control their main export. And in the case of Nigeria, this is oil. So the process was simple. One of the main ways that Shell would take control of Nigeria was by controlling the oil extraction infrastructure. To do this, Shell would tell the Nigerian government that we will develop your country, give you loads of jobs, give you tons of foreign investment if we're given permission to build the oil extraction infrastructure. And at first, this seems like a great deal for the Nigerian government. Being a poor country in need of foreign direct investment, they want foreign companies to build up Nigeria's infrastructure. Because if they do this, it means there's more investment in the country, there's more jobs, more prosperity, more tax and the better the country develops. So having this big multinational company offer to develop better extraction methods for your main export does seem like a win-win. However, this didn't come without a price because even though all the infrastructure would be on Nigerian land, Shell were the ones who would actually own and operate it. Which meant that in later years, Nigeria would become completely dependent on Shell for keeping about 1,000 Nigerian oil wells running. And with 95% of Nigeria's exports being oil, this then makes up 40% of their total economy. And now since Shell had control of the flow of oil in the country, they could now oversee almost half of Nigeria's total cash flow. And as Henry Kissinger said, whoever controls the money controls the world, and it was this factor that gave Shell unparalleled influence over the nation as a whole. It was a genius business move, because if Nigeria tried to change the deal and take back control of their own oil, Shell and any other oil company could halt extraction completely decimating the entire country's economy. And because of Shell's powerful connections to the British and Dutch royal families, as well as all the other major banks, they would then tell other big companies to pull out their investments in Nigeria, thus stripping Nigeria of everything, strangling the country into submission. Shell also controls the distribution network for the oil. So even if, by some miracle, Nigeria managed to gain control of the extraction process, they would still need Shell to export it out of the country. And this oil money doesn't just fuel Nigeria's economy, it also makes up over 65% of the Nigerian government's revenue, which means Shell is the Nigerian government's daddy. It's this reliance on Shell's infrastructure that really mirrors an abusive relationship, where the company can do whatever they want and the Nigerian government is powerless to stop them. If Shell ceased their oil extractions, it would push the economy into to a deep recession, all while leaving the government penniless and unable to do anything. This problem would then quickly lead to civil unrest and revolt, a fact that the Nigerian government is very aware of. But then why is the Nigerian government so passive to Shell? Why did they even let this happen? Well, this leads us onto the third stage of controlling a country, bribery. Once Shell had Nigeria dependent on them for oil, it was time to make their way into the government. Recently, an anti-corruption investigation revealed that Shell transferred Nigeria $1.3 billion, knowing that the funds would end up in the pockets of convicted money launderers. Once Nigeria received the $1.3 billion, it was then transferred to various middlemen instead of being spent on the country. Afterwards, $466 million of that was given to the Nigerian president and his subordinates. In return, Shell gained access to the OPL245 oil field, which increased the company's total oil reserves by one third. The EFCC is investigating whether the $1.3 billion purchase of OPL245 in 2011, in their words, included 
acts of conspiracy, bribery, official corruption and money laundering. Despite Shell and Nigeria's government enjoying their mutually beneficial relationship, the bribery wasn't exactly extended towards Nigerian civilians. Instead of reaping the country's newfound wealth, the majority of the population was hit with a seemingly never-ending stream of oil spills. Starting from 2010, nearly 3,000 spills have been recorded and attributed to Shell, with at least 29 million litres getting drained into Nigeria. For reference, that's enough oil to fill over 11 Olympic-sized swimming pools. These oil spills then pollute the entire country's water supplies. So by now, the water that Nigeria drinks is poisoned with cancer-causing substances, substances that also kill the surrounding nature, taking away the nature farming and fishing industries that many Nigerians are dependent on. The oil operations also contaminated the water supply and agricultural land, killing wildlife and destroying economies that were based on subsistence farming and fishing further impoverishing and poisoning the Nigerian people, making the Nigerians more and more dependent on Shell to give them money. As you can imagine, the local population wasn't all too happy with these constant oil spills, which leads us on to step four in taking over a country, controlling the civilians. While the methods of achieving this can vary from location to location, Shell has perfected controlling the populace. How could you make a country passive to your wrongdoings? How could you make them content with drinking cancer-causing water and having their entire country controlled by one company? If Shell couldn't control the civilians sooner enough, their control of the country would collapse, people would revolt, and time was ticking. Shell needed to come up with a plan soon. And so what did Shell do? Well, they kept their head down and denied any wrongdoing. All the four cases were sabotage, so not actually done by Shell, they were actually by criminals who steal products. In fact, up until 2011, Shell only claimed responsibility for less than 40,000 gallons of oil spilled, or around 0.5% of their actual number. And with the growing money and power Shell was harvesting from Nigeria, but denying any wrongdoing wasn't going to last. Shell needed to act like all good dictatorships, using all their power to squash any dissent with propaganda. Using the money they extracted from Nigeria, they would use this to crush the population. Now, Shell has a long history of trying to sway public opinion in their favor, but this hasn't been strictly through traditional means. Back in the 60s, Shell would secretly fund a number of articles that stoked the flames of a civil war in Nigeria. The company would play both sides against each other, which seemed to promise the Nigerian people resources that were theirs once the war was over. However, this was all smoke and mirrors. The deal still gave Shell full control of Nigeria's oil. But today the companies come up with more unique methods of propaganda. The effectiveness of Shell's new propaganda is their ability to blur the line between truth and lies. Leaks internal documents show Shell's real strategy of refocusing the narrative and attempting to point out the environmental progression that they're making. In the UK, 1.4 million households use 100% renewable electricity from Shell. The company's first target was charities and NGOs. Shell would separate groups between ones that would never support them and ones that might. Shell would then attempt to sway the middle of the road NGOs by attacking the aspects that criticize Shell, which basically means that if any organization shines a light on Shell's misdeeds, the company would simply counter that they are making green environmental changes, whilst also bribing charities and NGOs to turn a blind eye. Shell would then also focus on swaying international news organizations over to their side. To do this, they would use the same tactics they did with NGOs, but this time they would also overplay the significance of criminals drilling into oil pipes and causing spills. They would make these bogus claims that 98% of oil spills was all because of Nigerian sabotage, blaming Nigerian radicals and criminals for the damage that Shell was really doing. This news misdirection strategy then takes away blame from Shell and instead focuses it towards the Nigerian people. And now this propaganda helped internationally, but this PR maneuver wasn't swaying the Nigerian civilians. While it was effective in publicly muddying the waters, there was still massive civil unrest in Nigeria. People were sick of Shell exploiting all their resources, their nature, their jobs, impoverishing their people and giving them cancer. The country was rising up and Shell was in big trouble. The time was running out for Shell. They needed to do something drastic. How could they keep the populace quiet? How could they force the population to be passive? This was a hard thing to do as Shell was openly destroying the country. Tens of millions of people relied on fishing for their livelihood, yet these constant oil spills were poisoning the coast and devastating Nigeria's fish operations. All this bribery and propaganda just wasn't enough. Which brings us on to the fifth and final stage of Shell's takeover of Nigeria, and this was to eliminate any opposition with force. You see, by this point, the Nigerian civilians were on the brink of revolution. People were realizing they had been colonized by one single company. And so the Nigerian population began to protest. And one of these protesters was a man named Ken Sarawiwa, president of the Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People. From the very beginning, even though I was young, I could see that nothing was coming to the Ogoni people from the oil. This organization led a non-violent campaign against Shell's tyranny of Nigeria. And so, of course, Shell wasn't particularly fond of these protests, or Sarawiwa. This sort of pollution, to live with it in an area where land is 
in very high demand is completely destructive of the community. In fact, they were threatening Shell's complete control of the country. And so Shell allegedly tasked the Nigerian military to do their dirty work. You see, throughout Ken Sarawa Wiwa's life, there had been around 7,000 oil spills that contaminated the country's nature. This is just one of the places where decades of devastating environmental damage and pollution has been caused by the oil company Shell. The UN report released last week says it will cost $1 billion and 30 years to clean up the mess. Sarawiwa eventually had enough. He was sick of the Nigerian population becoming impoverished, sick, poisoned, and the nature surrounding him collapsing. And so he would organize multiple non-violent protests against the exploitation of Nigerian land, in addition to the lack of civilian financial benefits. This was causing Shell to start putting the hair out. They were never going to give in to Mosop's demands. And yet getting directly involved in crushing these protests would be bad for optics. Charities and NGOs could no longer support Shell if they started crushing dissent. The international community would shun Shell forever. Shell might even get a bad ESG score. So Shell had to get the middleman to do their dirty work. And luckily for Shell, the Nigerian military had no problem getting their hands dirty, as long as they were getting those juicy bribes. According to Amnesty International, the firm's executives encouraged a brutal crackdown to silence protesters in the Nigerian region of Ogoniland. And so after around five years of the protests, Shell finally turned. They finally had enough and ordered the arrest of Sarawiwa and eight other tribal leaders. Despite the protests being peaceful, the men were charged with incitement to murder and were subsequently executed by the government. I said yesterday that I thought this was a fraudulent trial, a bad verdict, an unjust sentence, and it has now been followed by judicial murder. Everyone knew that Shell was responsible for this, and so the company agreed to fork over a relatively meager $9.6 million in an out-of-court settlement. After cutting off the head of these protests, life for normal Nigerian civilians hasn't really improved at all. In fact, this has just further cemented Shell's control of the entire country, which is why radical dissenters have began taking matters into their own hands. Groups around Nigeria have started sabotaging pipelines in Nigeria, leading to even more spillage throughout the nation. This is inadvertently giving Shell more of an excuse to control the protests. Additionally, numerous oil company staff were kidnapped and held for ransom by a new militia called the Movement for the Emancipation of the Niger Delta. Although a ceasefire was called in 2009, this also didn't help matters either, as the Nigerian government would go on to announce an all-out oil war in the country. Shell and the Nigerian government against the impoverished poisoned population. Because Shell is an almost monarchy in Nigeria, it's going to take an entire revolution to get them out of the country. And to do this, it's going to almost certainly require third-party intervention, since the government and military are entirely in Shell's pocket and there's no sign of Shell slowing down anytime soon, as the military conflict regarding their oil operations in the Niger Delta is only getting worse. Violence is commonplace in the area, whether it be piracy, kidnappings, bombings, or other insurgency campaigns. All while Nigeria's resources are being poisoned by the day, with the population becoming more and more impoverished. All while the Western media praises Shell for their progressivism, helping the environment and helping stop climate change. I mean, Shell has literally taken over complete control of Nigeria, and yet there's still no real back clash in the West. So if you're a company planning on economically subverting a country, following in Shell's footsteps isn't a bad place to start. Stories like these are always buried behind the surface, because companies like Shell invest in established mainstream media news outlets, pressuring them to cover up these important topics. Because of this, independent media is more important than ever. Which is why I want to tell you about one of my favourite media outlets, the Epoch Times. The Epoch Times delivers truthful news without the influence of any government, corporation or political party. Bringing you breaking US and world news on all your devices, they also offer not only high quality reporting as articles, but also video programmes and exclusive documentaries on Epoch TV, with original Epoch TV programs like Crossroads, The Larry Elder Show, Facts Matter, American Thought Leaders, and award-winning documentaries. So then you may ask, why should you trust the Epoch Times? Well, because they focus on clear, fact-based journalism without spin or hidden agendas. They report on important news that other media outlets just ignore. These folks tell the truth, and we really mean that. We don't just take on any sponsor. If the New York Times reached out, we wouldn't take their money. But the Epoch Times just reports the facts, and they trust their discerning readers that's you to arrive at your own conclusions. So give them a try, we think you'd like it. We also have a special offer for you. If you click my link below, you can get $1 for two months. That's E-P-O-C-H-T-I-M dot E-S forward slash moon.